Hey YouTube, and welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge here on the internet. All right, today's video is the CIA versus the KGB, which was better during the Cold War by the Infographic Show. I'm trying to remember if I've seen anything from this channel before, but they get some good hits, and this I thought this was kind of interesting. I um, haven't done much really with the Cold War, I feel like, other than maybe oversimplified or something like that, but good to get back into that. So we'll uh, be checking that out, which will be very cool. Um, again, thank you to everybody that has been subbing. You'll notice our awesome uh, up there, the silver play button, which I did an unboxing video of earlier this week. But thanks again for helping the channel get to 100,000 subscribers. Um, eternally grateful that way. All right, uh, back to the video though. If you like this video, make sure you go down below, click on the link so you can give uh, a view, like, subscribe over to their channel. And if you haven't subbed to me yet, love to have you a part of our community as well. All right, let's get started. The CIA versus KGB, which was better during the Cold War. What do we got? This episode is brought to you by Dashlane. Try Dashlane Premium free for 30 days at dashlane.com slash infographics. And never forget another password and keep all your online accounts secure. The CIA and the KGB, two Cold Sorry War juggernauts issues. who jockeyed for advantage against each other for decades throughout the Cold War, launching countless campaigns against each other that resulted in proxy wars, assassinations, and even entire cultural revolutions. You know, by the way, if you didn't know, the reason why they call it the Cold War is because with this uh, between the United this, this conflict between the United States and Soviet Union after World War II, um, the two don't fight each other really directly. Um, they influence others, like they say, with proxy wars, things like Vietnam or Korea. Um, basically, the entire world was put into a tug of war between the United States and Soviet Union. It's like you got to pick one or the other, right? The American uh, capitalistic, democratic sort of way of life, and then the Soviet Union with uh, uh, communism, right? And everyone, they wanted basically everyone to choose, and they wanted allies. So um, now it's very thankful that they don't fight each other because, of course, this is the atomic age when nuclear weapon production is just unbelievable. So anyway, a little bit of setup. Have you ever wondered why they call it the Cold War? The rivalry between these two great spy agencies nonetheless very often helped prevent all-out nuclear war. But which agency was truly the greatest spy agency in the world, and which was ultimately more successful than the other during the 45 frigid years of Cold War? I mean, that's the biggest thing they say is it's it, it's a spy war, right? Each infiltrated each other and had hysteria. Each country's had hysteria that both were infiltrating that. In America, they called it the Red Scare. Um, that there was this, you know, and, and uh, it goes into with McCarthyism, with, uh, Senator McCarthy, who was, you know, saying that the that 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 Russian communist spies had infiltrated basically every agency in America. Although a lot of that info was not ever um, uh, proved, but yeah, in a way, it's like a spy war. During World War II, American President Franklin Roosevelt was concerned about the lack of American intelligence capabilities. Like <laughs> American isolationism, which had dictated so much FDR. of the USA's foreign policy before and after World War I, had given rise to a wholly insular attitude toward the rest of the world amongst American leadership. Thus, while great powers of Europe frequently made use of covert intelligence agents against each other, and even America, the US found itself with no such capabilities at the start of World War II. The British needed their American allies properly in the fight, and thus dispatched one of their intelligence chiefs to the US in order to teach their rebellious colonists how to undertake the dastardly acts of ungentlemanly warfare. From this initial training program, the Office of Strategic Services was born, and American commandos would undertake many daring missions throughout the war. After the war, the United States right. realized it could no longer afford to ignore the rest of the world, especially since Europe had developed the nasty habit of kicking off world wars every 20 years or so. Interesting to think that, you know, in American history, we did not have really an intelligence agency, right? And in an era, a technological era of uh, communication, uh, with communication being key, with new technologies that facilitate that, it makes sense. But it's kind of interesting that it didn't happen sooner. Um, it, it took till this long. 
To this end, the National Security Act of 1947 established both the National Security Council, which would advise the President on defense and intelligence matters, and the Central Intelligence Agency, a bona fide spy agency tasked with both peacetime and wartime intelligence gathering. It's always hard. It's even for, and for me. It's it's hard to keep track of all the agencies, all the government agencies that are out there, and trying to compare and contrast them. So we got the NSC, which you don't really hear much about, right? Um, defense intelligence matters, and you wonder what that kind of means, like, and how is that different than the CIA, which you never heard of them. So that's spy, the actual government sanctioned spy activities. And peacetime and wartime intelligence gathering. So you wonder what's the difference. I mean, one is, I guess, I guess they're saying that NSC is supposed to be just for um, advising the president specifically. Um, the CIA is obviously huge, though, and is the intelligent, real, I mean, really the intelligence agency of America. While the Americans were dipping their feet into foreign intrigue, the Russians were already old hands in the art of intelligence gathering. The KGB, or the Komitiet Gustadarstani Bizopasnistia. Uh, we're going to have a spelling test at the end of the video. You need to spell out fully what the acronym for KGB is. Um, if you do you get it wrong, you're uh, banned from the channel. So. Committee for State Security was formed in 1954 and formally gathered together Soviet intelligence operatives under one umbrella. Even before its start, though, the men that formed the KGB were seasoned masters of spycraft, themselves descendants of the early communist spies who helped topple the czars and establish the Soviet Union. So it's like they almost have a head start because um, spying was already an important part of the existence of the communist regime in general. Um, I didn't know that what the extent of, 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 of espionage was when they overthrow Nicholas and the um, Romanov family. Interesting. So it sounds like they got a they got a yeah like a, a head start on the Americans. Thanks to rising income inequality and disillusionment with capitalism throughout Europe, Soviet intelligence agents found many allies throughout the world. And by the time World War II started, they had so many agents operating inside France, Great Britain, and America that Stalin knew about his allies' military developments almost the same time they did. You know, people think today, because, I mean, obviously the, the, the Soviet Union is going to end, uh, they're going to lose the Cold War. But in, in those early years of the Cold War, like here in the 50s, it was not a foregone conclusion that American capitalism was going to be the way out. I mean, it seemed like a viable, like communism for, for a lot of people seemed like a viable option. So that, that decision was not as easy as people thought, especially in the developing world. Okay. In the, in the first world, it was pretty cut and dry. Most didn't obviously do that, but the third world, um, and places, places like in Africa or maybe Southeast Asia, um, it was far more of a difficult decision and led to a lot of internal conflicts in those countries about what do you think they should adopt? Um, because one thing that's definitely true after World War II, it's kind of like starting over, you know. The KGB would itself become one of the most legendary spy agencies of all time and develop a reputation for ruthless efficiency that made its agents feared around the world. Yet, the truth is that KGB agents were masters of their craft and could play any role they needed to masterfully. From deadly assassin to charming confidant, coaxing, manipulating, or forcing their targets to divulge their deepest secrets. Two of the world's most powerful intelligence agencies, but which is truly superior? To find out, we'll look at some of each agency's greatest successes. Okay. Americans may have been new to the spy game when the CIA was first established, but what they lacked in experience and technique, they more than made up for in sheer guts. Okay. Yeah, one thing we should look at before they, I mean, they're about to break this down, was just because the Soviet Union kind of loses in this and collapse, let's not necessarily doom them from the start and give it a fair shot to see if they, at least from the um, the spy agencies that, that, uh, that they were good. Maybe it wasn't their fault right, the, that it lost out. In May 1962, CIA agents got wind that the Soviets were abandoning a research facility deep in the Arctic. While the Arctic may be significantly warmer now than it was back then, in 1962 the icy conditions were so bad that shifting ice made the base's sole runway unusable. With supplies dependent on delivery via aircraft, the decision was made to pull the researchers out while a transport aircraft could still land. Um, that The Arctic is where the... Soviet Union did some of their biggest um, uh, nuclear weapons testing was was up there. They have some of those um, 
Island's up there, Severn Islands, Amalia. Is that the one, the big one, where like the Tsar Bomba was tested, which is the um, biggest uh, um, weapon ever detonated? Look into it sometime. Um, maybe I have to find a video to, to react on about that. It's an interesting one, the biggest bomb ever detonated. But they did a lot up there, which is why they were so used to that. And, of course, the Arctic is, is useful, too, because you can, um, uh, Northern Russia, of course, if you were to launch uh, weapons, potentially you could do it over the North Pole, right, to to America that way, which would be the shortest distance for them to actually fire. Plus, there's a, just it's a good place to do testing because no one in their right mind would be up there. With the base completely abandoned, the CIA leapt on the opportunity to gather intelligence on Soviet research. The freezing conditions had made the runway unusable once more, though, and with no sign of the weather letting up and fearing that the Soviets may return when it did, the CIA decided that there was only one way to get men into the facility. They would have to parachute in despite Ooh. freezing cold Arctic winds. Oh. Paratrooping or whatever uh, in the freezing Arctic air man you'd have to pay me a lot and i'm sure they're not getting paid a lot because it's the soviet union oh gusting at high speed what would be a suicide mission for most turned out to be one of the greatest intelligence coups of the cold war really? successfully parachuting Work? down to the station in near whiteout conditions the two cia men immediately plundered the facility of all useful intelligence oh sorry they're american later, they sorry did i screw that up they're american their plane pickup arrived. Yet there was no way the big B-17 could land on the frozen runway, which is why the CIA had developed a unique extraction technique pioneered in the Second World War, what? but never used in the extreme conditions of the far north Arctic. The men on the ground filled three balloons with helium and floated them into the sky. The skyhook system, as it came to be known, That was, was a real thing? I've heard of that. That's a real thing. I did not know that was a real thing. Float up and then it grabs you, like the plane flies by and then hooks you. More than a hook at the end of a winch, which was itself attached to the <laughs> interior storage no bay of an aircraft. The plane would fly the hook into a line hoisted up by the balloon, and then the entire line would be winched up into the plane. Attached to the first balloon was 150 oh, pounds of okay. secret Soviet so equipment it wasn't and the documents. People. The two agents on it's the ground, the stuff knowing that the skyhook system was extremely dangerous, and thus deciding that it was more important the secret equipment and documents be rescued than them. Despite very low visibility and strong winds, the B-17 managed to snag the first balloon and hoist it up into its cargo well. And two passes later, the agents on the Wait, ground were themselves winched to safety, dangling beneath a plane moving at over 150 <laughs> miles per hour through Arctic weather. The CIA had just proven that any lack of experience and technique on its part Who are was these more guys? than made up for in sheer courage and ingenuity. The data recovered showed that the Soviets had been working on techniques to detect American subs under the Arctic ice and to attack them. And it helped keep the U.S. subs hidden. People often forget there is no landmass at the North Pole. There's there's nothing there. Yeah, there might, there's some ice and stuff, but you can go under it, which is what they do. Um, yeah, there's not like an Antarctica of the North, you know. And from prying Soviet eyes. The United States may have led the way in computer technology, but the KGB was happy to exploit America's use of its advanced computer networks for its own benefit. In the late 1960s, the U.S. created ARPANET, or Advanced Research Projects Agency Network. This fledgling Legion. internet was used by U.S. research labs to share data nationally on secret defense projects. When you know, it's amazing. Some of these technologies are developed for spying and the space race. I mean, that's... It, it pushed America technologically, um, both both sides. But so many technologies came out of the Cold War for a potential war use or uh, whatever to get an advantage in the Cold War that that ends up, uh, you know, not being used, but then ends up being innovated into a more domestic use um, that we can all use. When the space shuttle was announced shortly after the successes of the Apollo program, the Soviets initially believed that the shuttle was secretly a space-based bomber, something which could threaten the entire Soviet Union. Yeah. That's what uh, people really feared in the space race was that like when Sputnik, the first satellite launched into um, to orbit, that the Russians launched, there was all kinds of hysteria that this thing was could be a wet, like was it a weapon or was it a spying device or something like that? It really had no function other than just had beeps and you could track it but uh people would freak out that yeah like war is now gonna go into space and rocket technology is gonna be used where you can yeah launch something into space and then come down and attack somebody with that so like not having to use like planes and stuff like that that was one of the scary part of the whole um cold war hysteria
Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev immediately tasked the KGB with plundering the secrets of the shuttle and demanded that the Soviet Union's Military Industrial Commission create their own. As work on the shuttle progressed throughout various labs across the US, the cooperating research teams made use of ARPANET to swap data back and forth. Aware of ARPANET's existence, Soviet spies in the US soon infiltrated the computer network and teased out troves of data about Yeah, there's uh, there's no digital security in this. I mean, this is like super proto internet, you know, in a way. It's not safe at all the shuttle, learning that it was indeed a peacetime reusable space vehicle and not a secret spaceborne bomber. Not wanting to be outdone by the US once more in the realm of space exploration, Premier Brezhnev ordered Soviet scientists to make full use of the stolen information, resulting in the Buran, a Soviet copy of the space shuttle. In many ways, the Buran is actually superior to the American shuttle, really? despite using stolen information from which to base their copy and the fact that it only ever flew once. This is because the American shuttle program was beset by outside pressures exerted by various politicians, and shifting priorities constantly changed what the core mission of the shuttle should be. Yeah, uh, the space program took such a nosedive after um, Apollo 11, after the, the moon landing. It's like once once we reached the moon and came back, the uh, funding died, and then the uh, yeah the funding died, and a lot of public interest kind of died with it. So it was uh, NASA had a hard has had a hard time ever since then um, to do that because it was like getting to the moon meant you won the space race, you know, and it's it's over, so no one cares as much. Forced to compromise in order to achieve a wider range of capabilities rather than a specific set of objectives, the shuttle was a fundamentally flawed design. The Soviet Buran, on the other hand, benefited from a single vision that drove its development, and the fact that Soviet lawmakers left its design almost solely in the hands of its chief architect, Valentin Glushko. While the Soviet Union was training and arming North Vietnamese forces during the Vietnam War, it had provided great amounts of aid to the North Koreans and the Chinese during the Korean War a decade before that. The CIA got the chance to take its revenge when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 1979. Even before a single Soviet tank rolled into Afghanistan, though, American agents had already uncovered intelligence that showed the Soviets were about to invade. For six full months hmm. before the invasion, CIA agents were already busy training Soviet Mujahideen. And yeah, I mean, that's a different story there. I didn't know that, yeah, some of that technology helped um, to do that because, yeah, the Americans support the Afghanis, uh, Afghanis there. Um, with that, because Afghanistan was seen as part of the Cold War, as like a tug of war between. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you got like the the Western influence, of course, that's within India, and that goes actually goes back to even when Britain was a colony of, um, or sorry, India was a colony of the British, and you had the Russians. They called the the Great Game, which was like playing the two against each other with Afghanistan in that region, and then it, this is this is happening. Um, by the way, the, the, the war in Afghanistan ends up being a big time failure for um, the Russians and was kind of their last real big military initiative as uh, as the Soviet Union because it ends up failing because it had so much support of the anti-communists like, like in America and things like that. Um, but it ends up being a disaster and, and hurting them economically, which you find in the 1980s was such a problem for them. Uh, one of the big one of the big issues between the two the two countries with this technological development for nuclear weapons and all that is it was kind of semi bankrupting the the Soviets. Um, they don't have the GDP to um, to be able to handle that. Where the American economy was stronger and could afford to put in the incredible amount of money, but it was such a big part of the budget for the Soviets that that plus military failures was the 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 final straw arming them with modern anti-tank and anti-air equipment. Much to the surprise of the Soviet commanders, the moment their troops stepped foot into Afghanistan, they came under fire from advanced precision weapons, such as Stinger missiles, which downed nearly 300 helicopters and 100 airplanes. Grooming contacts in the know Pakistani government, CIA operatives ensured that shipments of weapons, medicines, and other vital supplies made their way to Afghan warriors, who put up such a stiff resistance that the Soviet Union was forced to withdraw a decade later. While while many factors played a role in the collapse of the Soviet Union and America's triumph in the Cold War, the quagmire of manpower and capital that the CIA had turned Afghanistan into for the Soviets was a key factor in bankrupting the Soviet Union. 
Even before the KGB's official start, though, the men who would later birth the legendary spy agency had already achieved the greatest intelligence coup of the 20th century. In the years before World War II, modern physics hinted at a bomb with a potential for explosive power that could only be described as apocalyptic. Dubbed the Atomic Bomb, various nations around the world launched research programs in a frantic race to be the first to develop these doomsday weapons. At the time, many of the world's top physicists lived in Germany, or territories which quickly fell under German influence, and thus they fled their homeland seeking safety in the Soviet Union, France, Great Britain, and the US. As World War II began, the British undertook a great effort to gather up as many of these brilliant physicists as they could in order to keep them from falling into Nazi hands. The Soviet Union lacked the scientific expertise of Great Britain or the U.S., however. And in well, yeah, I mean, we hear about that with guys like uh, one of Ron, bon, Ron, Ron, Ron Braun, um, German engineer, uh, physicist, scientist that came over and helped in the early NASA years and helped finding that because... Um, the, the Germans during World War II had such a big emphasis into science that those were some of the leading scientific minds. And once the war was over, it was like, yeah, trying to gobble that up, gobble up those, those highly intelligent, skilled people. Bid to ensure it was not left out of the race to develop a nuclear weapon, it very quickly got to work infiltrating the nuclear programs of Great Britain and the United States. If the Soviets could not develop their own bomb, they would steal the knowledge to build one from their allies. German refugee theoretical physicist Klaus Fuchs was one of the many scientists scooped up by the British, who fully vetted the young scientist and quickly shipped him to the United States, where the world's greatest concentration of scientific genius was gathered with a single goal, beat the Nazis to a working atomic bomb Fuchs proved I'm sure they'll, they'll get to it but the Manhattan Project who was charged with uh, developing the atomic bomb was a super secretive organization that was doing that but it got infiltrated by by the um, Soviets which is amazing because it's one of the most top secret and well organized things but yeah they they infiltrated the highest level of security which pretty frightening when you think about it um, if your nation has that kind of vulnerability even from such a uh, highly protected supposedly agency an invaluable addition to the Manhattan Project and his work sped along the development of a working bomb. Unfortunately for the US and Great Britain though, Fuchs was also a Soviet agent. Recruited by Soviet intelligence and groomed to spy on their behalf, Fuchs was just one of many Soviet spies who had penetrated the Manhattan Project so deeply that Soviet intelligence knew of its existence even before the American FBI did. That's amazing. I didn't know who exactly so to look more into that guy, who ex like what what were there, who the specific people were, um. But yeah, that's that's crazy. The stolen work would ensure that just four years after the end of World War II, the Soviet Union had its own nuclear weapon. Both the CIA and the KGB are legendary agencies in their own rights, and both sides scored incredible victories against each other throughout the 45 years of the Cold War. Yet, in the end, the KGB is widely acknowledged by intelligence officials around the world as being the superior spy agency, with capabilities so extensive that for almost 10 years the CIA feared recruiting any Soviet agents for fear of being penetrated by moles. While the US enjoyed the security of two oceans for the first half of the 20th century, Russian agents were fighting a covert war against their own czars, and eventually the start. other great powers of Europe. This vast experience helped produce one of the most sophisticated and capable spy agencies that the world has ever known. And despite its eventual end with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, its capabilities have been passed on to a new generation of intelligence agents who now work for the Russian Federal Security Bureau. The cyber war between the CIA and the FSB is already happening, and it's normal people it's like over. you and me who stand the, the, the spying. I mean. <laughs> Right, if it's 2019, I'm making this video, and man, you can't go very long without hearing about spying and collusion and all that stuff that that happens in elections and and just uh, cyber security, which is uh, one of the biggest threats in our age. Biggest chance of getting caught in the middle, but you don't need to have the resources of an army to protect yourself. Dashlane is the one and only tool you need to keep VPN you safe thing. online, and their multi-country VPN lets you browse safely and privately, no matter where you are across any device. Don't leave yourself vulnerable to digital snooping or malicious hackers. Give Dashlane and its features-packed VPN guys. a try today. We 
love using Dashlane because not only does it act as a best-in-class VPN, it will send you breach alerts for when one of your online accounts is compromised by a hack. Be safe online while the rest of the internet is at war. Head over to www.dashlane.com slash infographics for a free 30-day trial, and if you use the coupon code infographics, you can get 10% off a premium subscription today. Which do you think is the superior spy agency? The KGB or the CIA? Why or why not? Let us know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content. Okay. This episode is brought to you by... Okay. All right. So let's talk real quick about... What do you think? Who... who, who uh... Who is the better agency? I, I kind of, my initial thought is to actually go with the KGB and almost entirely because I think the most, it seems like the most successful spy effort of the entire Cold War started before the Cold War and that is the infiltration of the Manhattan Project. I mean, something that was supposed to be so top secret and the effects are huge because of course the, the the atomic plans that were uh, stolen from the, the um, from the Manhattan Project were directly used for the building up of their nuclear program, right? We have to wonder what would the Russian nuclear program have been without the infiltration of the Manhattan Project? Would there even be one? Because um, they just co they copied it, right? And that brings in the the hysteria, the the um, the whole atomic hysteria, right? Anxiety with that so i mean if what, what we're talking about i mean if you look at okay what were the cia's big big achievements okay they got a heads up on the invasion of afghanistan okay uh they went paratrooped into the arctic and found some information about okay they were working on sub technology like okay big deal plus just look at the red scare look who it's like which nation became more apprehensive at the public eye about potential espionage in their country. Isn't it got to be the, at least the Americans. I mean, it, it, it just rattled the 1950s um, that with McCarthyism, like they're infiltrated, they are everywhere. They're in every institution. They're in government. They're in the, um, they're in our education system. That was a big one that they're, they're teachers and professors and at every institution that they're everywhere. And people were freaked out and the, it got that, uh, just that nasty term of, of, of a communist, you know, and that everyone was there and everyone's pointing fingers and people are going after each other and accusing each other of things. It's like the hysteria in a way, you know, might have been a bigger, bigger impact psychologically here in America. So I don't know. Um, I guess if I had to pick one just based off the information, um, change my mind if you got some other uh, things. But yeah, I, yeah, I kind of want to lean towards the KGB there. Now, it does make sense why they were better. Like they were saying, I didn't understand that this was directly influenced from the same so, I guess kind of spy agency that was really influential in the taking down of the czars and the monarchy of Russia. So they had that experience where America's whole intelligence program was very, very late and started fresh. So it makes sense why the Russians um, or Soviets, I should really just refer to them as um, were, were able to be so successful. And we see, I mean, they infiltrated the Manhattan project. That was not supposed to happen from the American perspective. I mean, there were so many people working on the Manhattan project that didn't even know what it was. It was a totally need to know basis. Only a few people really knew what it was actually doing. Again, there were people working that were sworn to secrecy, working on a project that didn't even know what it was going to be. Um, so yeah, Americans. And yeah, they said the Russians knew before American, uh, Americans even knew about the program. So, I mean, I think that, I think that's pretty big there. So anyway, let me know what you think down in the comments or better yet, join our discord server and hop into our cold war channel. And, uh, you can get a conversation going with that with one of our over 4,200 current members, um, of the discord server. That would be awesome. All right. So on the way out here, um, any other ways you can support the channel through a lot of ways. Thanks for subbing, liking the videos. Uh, you can also support the channel through Patreon, which also gives you access to polls and also some Discord benefits that uh, specifically with the polls can get you a little more influence on videos that come on here. I like to post polls to um, see which videos you guys would like to would like to see, but that'd be awesome. But thanks first and foremost for just being here, being a part of the community. Thanks again for helping the channel get to uh, 100,000 subscribers. We'll see what I do with the, the silver play button plaque thing. I don't know if that's a good spot for it. We'll see. But thanks again for that and being a part of that. And uh, we'll see you soon. Bye.